thank you for joining us today. I'm going to be talking with Dr. Rob Odds from the Brigham Women's Hospital about a new innovation in esophageal adenocarcinoma screening for Barrett's esophagus. And he's agreed to answer some questions for us today, and we're really excited that he could be here. So Dr. Odds, could you just start off by introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about you as a pathologist? Thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to speak. Uh, so I'm a GI pathologist. Um, I uh, work at the Brigham Women's Hospital at, in Harvard Medical School. And um, the bulk of my research uh, over the past 25 years has been in uh, evaluation of the um, pathologic features, natural history, molecular features, outcome, and treatment of preneoplastic lesions of the GI tract, most notably Barrett's esophagus and inflammatory bowel disease. We're here to discuss Barrett's esophagus today. Uh, actually, some of the applications I talk about may be applicable to IBD as well, but really the technology that we're referring to today, the WASP screening technology, is something that's directly applicable to Barrett's esophagus, which has been an area of my research uh, uh, commitment over the past 25 years. So Dr. Reitz, can you tell us what your role has been with CDX laboratories that developed the Watts 3D technology? How have you been involved with them? And so I've been consulting for the company for a number of years when they started developing the technique. And now I'm consulting with them uh, and helping them uh, provide uh, the ability of pathologists all over the world uh, to be able to perform Watts diagnostics in their own laboratory. This is the, so the pathology partners program. So I'm consulting with them and helping them develop and implement the pathology partners program where a pathologist from any laboratory or cytologist would be able to sign out Watts specimens after, after having uh, some, uh, uh, some training, which can occur either on site or at CDX laboratories. Why is crypt dysplasia so important in Barrett's esophagus? Okay, that's a good question. So for those viewers who, who aren't familiar with dysplasia, um, cancer in Barrett's esophagus develops through a inflammation, metaplasia, dysplasia, carcinoma sequence. The challenge in patients who have uh, esophageal cancer is to detect uh, uh, high-risk patients. High-risk patients, obviously, before they develop adenocarcinoma at stages prior to adenocarcinoma. So in the cases of, of patients who have Barrett's esophagus, we, number one, want to be able to detect patients who have Barrett's esophagus. That's a challenge uh, because a lot of patients out there, a lot of people in the general population have heartburn but only a small fraction of the patients of, of the population of heartburn actually develop a Barrett's esophagus. And then a, a small fraction of the Barrett's esophagus patients actually go on to develop cancer. So it's a challenging aspect of preventative medicine is to number one, identify those patients with Barrett's, and then two, to identify the high-risk Barrett's esophagus patients who will go on to progress to cancer. Um, as far as the high-risk patients go, what we do as pathologists, uh, we want to uh, uh, document the presence of Barrett's esophagus, which is based on, at least in the U.S., not necessarily all over the world, but is based on uh, pathologic uh, confirmation of uh, intestinal metaplasia and biopsies of the esophagus. That's one aspect of the Watts technology that we do. Uh, uh, the second is... Um, identification of precursor lesions like I mentioned before, and that relates to your issue of crypt dysplasia. So dysplasia is essentially categorized either negative, uh, indefinite, means we don't really know uh, whether it's reactive or dysplastic, and then positive for dysplasia, which is either low and high grade. What we've learned over the past five or 10 years or so is that dysplasia starts in the crypt bases and then eventually progresses up the crypt to involve the surface epithelium. Traditionally, we as pathologists have only been able to recognize dysplasia when it's involved in both the crypt and surface epithelium, essentially the full thickness of the mucosa. And that's where we start grading it as either low grade or high grade. Research over the past five years, some from my lab, some from others, has shown that we can now identify earlier phases of dysplasia when it only involves the crypt, which is where it begins. And that's been referred to as crypt dysplasia or dysplasia limited to the crypts. Another way to think about that is simply low-grade dysplasia or early low-grade dysplasia when it involves just the crypts. So low-grade dysplasia involving the crypts, so-called crypt dysplasia. 
the advantage of that is that, of course, identifying high-risk cases patients is what we want to do. Uh, identifying patients who have dysplasia is what we want to do, and we don't want to miss patients who have. We have been missing those who have early dysplasia, so-called quick dysplasia, and now I think we have the ability to identify that reliably, and I think the recent data that I think we're going to discuss in this interview shows that uh, a dysplasia and involves pulmonary crypt bases is essentially a high-risk lesion, a lesion that renders patients at increased risk of progression and something we definitely want to detect at an earlier stage. So, Dr. Oz, have there been studies uh, that have shown that crypt dysplasia is really important for progression to cancer? Yes. Uh, uh, there's been a couple of uh, histology studies uh, based on forceps biopsies, uh, small numbers of patients with limited follow-up. The real uh, significant study is one uh, recently presented at the um, uh, American College of Gastroenterology meeting in Philadelphia in October of 2018, uh, which was a, a very large study of lost specimens looking at the outcome of Barrett's esophagus without dysplasia, uh, patients who have crypt dysplasia, once again, low-grade dysplasia involving the crypt bases, and those with traditional full thickness low-grade dysplasia. This was an outcome study of, uh, I believe it was in total over 5,000 patients. Uh, and in that study, uh, the progression rate of patients with Barrett's without dysplasia was about 0.3%, which is really right in line with what's published for uh, uh, traditional forceps biopsy tissue related studies. And the outcome for low grade dysplasia uh, was also similar to what you'd seen in, in, re in uh, uh, forceps biopsy studies. But this one, for the first time, showed the outcome of patients with crypt dysplasia to progression to high-grade dysplasia or cancer was about 2%. So just a little bit lower than high-grade, but certainly a lot higher uh, than patients uh, without dysplasia. So I think for the first time, we found out that uh, this is definitely a high-risk lesion and a lesion that uh, is an actionable lesion, probably one that should be either watched very carefully or perhaps uh, ablated just like other patients with dysplasia. Can you just tell us about the Watts 3D technology it, from the point of view of a pathologist? I mean, obviously, okay. there's a lot of technical components, and there's a computer, you know, assisted version. Yeah. But from, from as a pathologist, tell us about, about that technology. Okay. Um, well, in order to tell you fully, even though we're pathologists, let me just brief on what, what sure. this is. Absolutely. There's two essential aspects to the Watts 3D technology. Uh, the first starts with endoscopy, uh, with the use of their, uh, of their brush. It's, it's a type of brush uh, with hard bristles that enables the endoscopist to sample uh, deep aspects of the mucosa right down to the crypt bases uh, because the crypts are stuck onto the muscularis mucosa pretty stiffly. Uh, uh, you can get them, of course, with deep biopsies, but with a regular brush sample, you don't really get deeper layers of the mucosa, which is where the action is, as I was, we were talking about before. That brush enables you to get deep aspects of the epithelium, so you're getting the full thickness of the epithelium with the crypts, which is what you're looking for. The second aspect of the brush, of course, is that it covers more surface area, and that's where the term Watts 3D is, wide area transepithelial sampling. The biggest problem and biggest clinical problem in Barrett's esophagus screening and surveillance is that sampling error. We miss a lot of tissue. Um, even using the so-called Seattle protocol, uh, which uh, implies biopsies every four quadrants, every two centimeters of the esophagus, you're missing more than 90% of the mucosa. The idea of screening and surveillance is to detect dysplasia in high-risk patients. If you're not going to be sampling the majority of the mucosa, you have a huge sampling error problem, and then obviously a failure to detect high-risk patients. So the, the Watts brush... Uh, um, as clearly shown in several retrospective and prospective studies to increase the area of sampling uh, of the mucosa, which is essential. So sampling area is, is maximized as opposed to minimized. Two components to the Watts sample. Uh, the first is uh, a traditional cytology smear. So the brush is smeared onto a slide, stained with PAP. That becomes a smear, which then I'm going to talk about a little bit further because that undergoes computerized analysis. The second is the brush is cut off uh, uh, um, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, 
wire essentially that's uh, put through the endoscopy tube and that brush is put into a separate uh, uh, container it's fixed and it's processed as a cell block essentially um, a mini biopsy sample and that cell block has numerous pieces of tissue that are, are, are actually pieces of tissue, uh, strips of epithelium, small pieces of mucosa. Uh, so it's kind of in between a cell block and a actual biopsy sample. So is that, that whole brush head is embedded like a block or they, they exfoliate the cells off? They exfoliate the cells from the cell block. Like a standard mm -hmm. cell block. Okay, yeah. go ahead. And that okay. cell block then undergoes both H&E staining and uh, special stains, immunized chemical stains, and also computer analysis. And by the way, what I didn't tell you about is that the sample is obtained, the brush is obtained through a regular endoscope at the time of regular endoscopy. Uh, the, the brush is inserted through the scope, the sampling is done of the mucosa, and it's pulled out of the endoscope. So it's a procedure that occurs during normal endoscopy. No um, special procedures are needed to do this other than regular? No special procedures, no. Regular endoscopy, and it's actually pretty quick. So we're getting back to the smear sample and the cell block. Let's talk about the smear sample. The smear sample uh, then undergoes the uh, WAS 3D uh, neural network computerized analysis. That's the magic sauce, if you will, the special sauce. The whole, sky, the whole slide is scanned into the computer uh, as a first step. And then the computer does a number of things. Uh, number one, it does a um, neural network analysis to detect and configure the 200 most atypical cells or cell clusters. Uh, and it does this through uh, um, uh, algorithms, essentially. Two, it then uh, uh, is imaged in a three-dimensional manner and using algorithms that put a three-dimensional cellular aggregates together onto a two-dimensional image by avoiding all the potential problems when one does that, which is like overlapping of nuclei and uh, making nuclei look bigger than they really are. Uh, and that's really the special sauce. So it's essentially, it's making a three-dimensional image out of the cell aggregates. And it's photographing those. And those images are then available to the pathologist when they sign up the specimen. It's a very unique uh, image. It's very 3D-like, and it has incredible clarity. That's the magic sauce, if you will. You're, out, you're not just seeing slices of the cell clusters. You're actually seeing on-fast images of the whole prints. Um, that's the smear. The cell block uh, undergoes regular H&E staining and then a variety of immunistic chemical stains that can aid in number one, detection of goblet cells, and two is detection of neoplastic uh, lesions. Uh, and it also undergoes a computerized analysis of both the H&E and the immunistic chemical uh, stains. Those two slides and the immunistic chemical slides are presented to pathologists who have all the slides for review at a microscope, a traditional microscope, and also uh, a computerized monitor which has all the images of the smear in front of them. So the diagnostic interpretation is done by looking at the microscopic smear, cell block, and immunistic chemical slides, in addition to the images that you have on the computer screen. Great, that, that's amazing. I mean, it sounds like what you've really done is taken, or what, what this technology has done is taken the idea of cytology, the idea of histology, and computer-aided diagnostics and put it all together in package to give a better result for that patient. So, so many fact, I refer to that, I refer to that as actually histocytology. Histocytology. I like yes, that. because <laughs> you, the cell block is very histology-like, yeah. the, the smear is very cytology-like, but in reality, the interpretation of the smear is, is combining histology with cytology because it presents a 3D image right. and with clarity. Um, uh, it's quite amazing. So that's really cool. Mm -hmm. So many, many ASCP members are pathologists. They're laboratory professionals. They work in, in GI pathology. How would this technology affect their workload and their, their workflow um, if, if this were to be moved into, say, a laboratory? Um, like if you were using this every day at the Brigham, how would this change what you, what you normally do? Um, so uh, the company is uh, expanding. 
and uh, developing a so-called pathology partnership program, P3, uh, where pathologists like you and I are from any laboratory will have the setup necessary to be able to sign out lot specimens. So the equipment would be uh, set up at the laboratory of the pathologist or cytologist, and uh, the slides would be sent, couriered. The images would be, uh, of course, uh, downloaded uh, via the internet. And you would sign out cases uh, in your own laboratory as the pathologist to at uh, CDX laboratories. The setup uh, is pretty easy. They would be trained uh, according to uh, the criteria uh, uh, for Barrett's and dysplasia. And then you would sign out those samples and, and uh, the company would reimburse uh, for uh, each individual case. Uh, that's how the process is being conceived to expand it beyond just the pathologists at CDX laboratories. Remember, uh, Watts is a adjunctive technique. It's not a technique now to replace biopsies. So patients will still have the same amount and number of biopsies from the endoscopy. This is adjunctive in addition to that, uh, where you would be evaluating the routine biopsies, forceps biopsies, plus uh, the Watts biopsies, and be reimbursed for that uh, specific uh, um, part of the, of the diagnosis. Um, a report is generated, of course, electronically and then disseminated to the physician uh, for his uh, interpretation. So do you think the Watts technology is going to impact that mortality? Is this going to be something that actually reduces the risk of death in these patients? Great question. The reason, one of the many reasons why death is so high is because actually 95% of esophageal cancers that are detected in humans are not detected during the course of screening and surveillance. They're detected at the time the patient has cancer. We do a really lousy job of surveillance. Only 5% of cancers in the esophagus are detected during the course of surveillance. And it's because of the difficulties of sampling error and interpretation uh, um, uh, when patients have Barrett's esophagus. If we're gonna decrease the incidence of esophageal cancer, we've got to prevent it. Uh, just like we're trying to do in colon cancer and breast cancer and any of the other major cancers, cervical cancer. Um, this is a technique that, that, that improves on the two main liabilities of uh, screening and surveillance. One, and first and foremost, is sampling error. And two, is interpretation error. Uh, and uh, so I do think that this is a technique that will help lower uh, esophageal cancer rates. We haven't talked about yet the aspect of Watts which I find just as helpful, and that is its ability to aid the detection of goblet cells, since that's currently still part of the definition of Barrett's esophagus in the US. We detect far more goblet cells, far more dysplasia, but also far more goblet cells in intestinal metaplasia than forceps biopsies do. This has been shown in a couple of studies as well. At the moment, my impression is that upper GI screening for patients is not as common as lower GI screening. Like everybody gets colon cancer screening, but not that many people are getting upper GI screening. So what do you think could be done to improve the rate of screening in patients with such a high mortality hanging over our heads? And how can the, the Watts 3D help with that? Yeah, well, it's, yes, there are quite a bit of upper GI endoscopy screening going on. Not as much as colon cancer. Colon cancer is a bigger cancer, is a, a more, more prevalent cancer. But I, but I would argue that the mortality in, mort in colon cancer is very low because yeah. of that screening. Yes. Because they're enough. years ahead of us in terms of the lower GI tract is years ahead of the upper GI tract in terms of cancer prevention. Uh, that's where we've got to move towards the upper GI. The challenge in upper GI is to determine who needs to be screened and then surveyed if found to be positive. A lot of people have heartburn. And so determining who of the heartburn patients need to be screened is the challenge. I would argue that we under screen because again, 95% of cancers are detected outside of surveillance. Upper GI endoscopy is a much simpler procedure than lower GI endoscopy. It doesn't require uh, um, uh, preparation at all. That gruesome you know, overnight process of cleaning out your bowel doesn't exist with upper GI. So it's easier and it's quick. It's uh, typically less than five minutes. 
so I don't know why we don't have more widespread upper uh, GI screening, but we should. Uh, and that's the clinical challenge is to figure out uh, who of the heartburn patients need to be screened. Once you've got the screening and surveillance being done, then you know our goal is to be able to find the lesions that are there. And that's by reducing sampling error and by increasing our ability to interpret. Uh, so that's the challenge. It, it sounds like the patient journey for upper endoscopy now versus upper endoscopy with Watts um, is very, it's very similar. There would, there'd almost be no difference for the patient in having this done. It would just be more help for the pathologist to answer the question. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, the procedure is the same. So uh, um, Watts is not a separate endoscopy. If a patient's having an endoscopy, they'll typically have their, their if, if the endoscopist feels there's evidence of Barrett's esophagus endoscopically, they'll take his routine biopsies. Uh, and, and then after the biopsies are complete, uh, the Watts brush will be performed, which takes under a minute. Uh, uh, whether the biopsies are taken first or the Watts brushing is done first doesn't really matter. Some physicians use the biopsies first and then the Watts brush, and, and some people uh, use the brush and then the biopsies. Uh, both are, are considered fine. So all it does is add a few extra minutes to the endoscopy, which the patient has uh, anyway. And then after that, it's all pathologic interpretation. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Oz, for joining us today. As an internationally recognized expert in gastrointestinal pathology, we really appreciate you telling us about this technology and your experience with it and the effects it can have on both our patients and our pathologists. And I really do appreciate it um, and hope that we can speak with you again soon. Okay. Well, thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm happy to talk anytime. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.